The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... I think for, for Chippewa County to be able to have the third and fourth oldest canoes in the state of Minnesota is beyond amazing, in my opinion. People always come in and say, it'd be great to do what you love to do. And I always look at them, why do anything else? If you could bring something out of somebody that's there already to make them more uh, confident, I think it's important. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. We have actually two, so we're the only historical society in the state that is fortunate to have two dugout canoes. That's pretty cool. Um, our Minnesota River Canoe was found in 1982 by a, a couple of uh, local people, and uh, that is located out in our Gippy Log Cabin. Um, that is the fourth, large, fourth oldest canoe um, of the dugout canoes within uh, Minnesota right now. And uh, that canoe, as I mentioned, uh, came out of the Minnesota River. Um, and anything, I don't know that everybody realizes this, but anything that comes out of the Minnesota River or any of the rivers in Minnesota is property of the state of Minnesota. So when the guys removed that canoe, um, they no longer, they, they did not own it. And so there was a, some discussion back and forth on what happens to the, to the canoe and our organization was fortunate enough to be able to bring it down here. The Chippewa River canoe was one and it's the only artifact our organization has ever purchased. was purchased on an auction sale in 1985 and we spent $80 for the canoe. Um, may sound like a, a very little and a lot of people have said I'll give you $80 for the canoe. Although for our organization at that time that was a great deal of money. What we call the Chippewa River Canoe um, is, is what we fondly refer to as Ole's Canoe. Ole Torgerson was a Norwegian immigrant, came to uh, the United States in the 1850s, I believe. And he came to Minnesota, specifically to Chippewa County in the mid to, to late 1860s. When we received the Chippewa River Canoe, we were told, and our records show that um, Ole Torgerson made this canoe in the 1930s, which was kind of pretty cool, and that, that's, that's what our records show, and we, and we had no reason to, to not believe what the story was told to us. About a year and a half ago, Heritage, Maritime Heritage Minnesota contacted us and wanted to um, uh, carbon date, radiocarbon date our dugout canoe. They knew about the Minnesota River one because that was on the, um, the uh, state archaeologist list. But I mentioned to them that we also had a second canoe. And so they came in to um, radio carbon date it. We send our uh, samples to a beta analytic in Florida. So yeah, we don't do it ourselves. We just take the samples. And there's a special way you have to do that, too. Uh, you basically drill 
a quarter inch diameter hole about a quarter inch deep and uh, you don't save the shavings from that but then you drill a slightly smaller diameter hole in that existing hole and you drill enough shavings to basically fill uh, about the size of a uh, the cup that an eraser on a pencil sits in. So about a hundred milligrams, I think. The two canoes in the Chippewa County Historical Society uh, are the third and fourth oldest watercraft in the state. Um, of our, in our report, in our, in our project, we documented the eighth, eight oldest watercraft in the state. There's nothing older. And that's incredible um, for, for a group of artifacts. The oldest one is the Lake Minnetonka dugout canoe. Then there's one that was taken out of the um, Big, Swan River, or Big Swan Lake uh, in Meeker County. It's actually housed in McLeod County, but it was taken out of Meeker County. Then Ole's canoe is the third oldest canoe in the state. Then the Minnesota River dugout canoe is the fourth oldest. And then there's four more after that. Ole's canoe is over 500 years old up to maybe 450. There's a range of dates with carbon dating. You can't get a specific date, especially these are considered new artifacts. If you have an artifact that's 40,000 years old, you'll get a more, a better date on that because of how carbon, for, there was no nuclear bombs going off or anything way back then that does help. And the stuff is, the samples come out better. There's not a skew. The Minnesota River one is, is 350 to 400 ish in there. So it's pretty old too. That's a Mississippian culture. That, that's pretty impressive, that one as well. The reason artifacts are preserved are many reasons, and often it's if they're covered up in mud. Um, a canoe in a lake or river will survive if it's covered up. Uh, if it's left, if it, the lake dries and it comes uncovered, it's going to start to deteriorate. Uh, the best thing for a shipwreck, or be a canoe or a big wreck, whatever, is cold, fresh, deep water. Now, deep is relative. 20 feet can be deep enough if, it, if no one bothers it. Uh, the, lakes, the lakes and rivers of Minnesota are very cold, even in the summer. So it's, it's very great for preservation. Dugout canoes are mainly built by prehistoric Indians, and by nature it's prehistory. They don't leave anything behind that was written. It was just their cultural material. And uh, this tells us, this is important for that, uh, because it's all we know about the people that came before us in, the, on, in Minnesota. Uh, it, and in a sense, dugout canoes were probably the most technologically complex thing the uh, Aboriginal peoples built back then. And uh, that's, to me, that's very interesting. A dugout canoe is constructed by what we think. This is from North Carolina because there's one picture from the 1600s, literally a lithograph, uh, of Native Americans burning the, hull, the inner uh, bits out of a, of a fallen tree trunk. They firstly burned the tree to get it down because they don't have axes or anything like that. They didn't have those kind of tools. Uh, so they, they'd fell a tree by burning it and then carefully burn the inside core out of the tree trunk as much as they could and burn that out to get that rid of that wood. And then, as far as, it depends what time of history we're talking about, the older canoes in Minnesota, including Ole's canoe, and the Minnesota, Minnesota River dugout canoe that's also at the, in Chippewa County. Those two were then finely carved out using chipped stone tools. Right now, it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, we've been working on, on a, an exhibit that will um, totally focus on our dugout canoes in, inside my office building. Um, we had a mural commissioned uh, last year I think knowing our past, we better prepare to know our future, know where to go from here. Um, I think our past is interesting, as is. Uh, you don't need to embellish it or anything, you can just study it. And uh, it's, it's good for that. I think every historical society in the state and in the country has amazing treasures within their collection. I also think we all somewhat take for granted what we have and we don't always realize what we have until somebody comes in and really points those things out. I think for, for Chippewa County to be able to have the third and fourth oldest canoes in the state of Minnesota and have the canoes that are the most intact 
and in the best condition is beyond amazing, in my opinion. Visit Pioneer.org for more information on postcards and other Pioneer productions. Pioneer On Demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience, including past episodes of postcards. My name's uh, Scott Hansen, and um, I'm a wood carver. I mainly use the chainsaw, but I use all tools. Um, so, and they're starting to call me an artist, and I think that's a real compliment. Uh, my career progressed in chainsaw carving. When I was here, I just had a, a tree in my yard, and I thought I'd try this. And then I had a, a tree in mom and dad's yard, a big um, elm tree that died, so I thought I'd try it. And I think the great big elm tree that was in um, mom and dad's yard, I spent uh, weeks on it. And I said, I'm never going to do this again. And then my best friend said, well, I have a tree. And people just kind of kept me busy. Where I seen a big improvement pretty fast. And then I went and visited my sister in Alaska. And I made her something. And then both neighbors on each side wanted something. Both neighbors on each side of them wanted something. Pretty soon the whole block wanted something, so I knew I had a, um, people wanted my, wanted this kind of stuff. Chainsaw artist is, they take a chainsaw to a tree and they carve out um, basically whatever they see or it develops in what they see. So it's a fast tool, it kind of carved, I mean, because you're moving a lot of wood fast. This is what I do, I take the chainsaw, rough it out, and then I got other tools that I fine tune it a little bit, and that's pretty much what I do. And so this is what I started, and this is kind of the uh, finished product when I'm all said and done. So I probably, I don't know how much time I have in that, but I probably got another hour left to get it to this point here with the tools that I have. No, I didn't go into school to this. Um, pretty much uh, self-taught, um, but it was kind of an answer to my, uh, my dad's prayer. I had a real bad time in my life, and then all of a sudden I picked up a chainsaw, and then I became got a passion for this. And then I, I can say self-taught, but I think it's a little bit of Lord-taught. Yeah, I've been in quite a few competitions. Um, I've done the World Championship Ice Carving. I think five, six times, and I've placed second a couple times, and that's the world championship. And then uh, a lot of chainsaw carvings. I've been to Chetwin, and that's the chainsaw capital of the world. I got second there. And then we have competitions like in Sedovia. I have a competition, and then other competitions that I've taken first quite a few times. My favorite thing I carve is kind of the, I get that question asked a lot. Um, it's kind of the last thing that I've done. Um, if you'd say my favorite thing now, I've, I enjoyed carving on this mermaid over here. So I'd say it's one of my favorite ones until I start something else. When I came here, um, kind of searching again, I kind of hit a crossroad where there's a point that almost all carvers come that you got to pursue the art or pursue the money. And I was sick of chasing after the money, you know, where you're always doing something for somebody else and you're putting a price. So I kind of came back to my place here, to my own roots, and then kind of pursue my art, and not about the money. So now it's about the passion to what I want to do, instead of where you're always com commissioned to do something or this and this, where this is more of my products of what I feel like I want to do. People always come in and say, it'd be great to do what you love to do. And I always look at them, why do anything else? I've been kind of hidden away in my brother's chicken barn where not too many people have found me and um, kind of got to pursue my art here. Where, and it's kind of catapulting me to a different mindset um, where I'm not before of a chainsaw carter. It's like, you know, 
whip it out and get it done and sell it and get another one where I've been kind of taking more time and, and actually enjoying what I'm doing instead of just, you know, hurry up and get it done and get another one done and kind of get off that treadmill type of thing. I got a six animal carousel and it's um, um, it's a it's a moose, a caribou, a fish, a bear, a walrus, a sheep, a doll sheep. And when I did this, I just looked at the heads and I thought, I wonder if anybody would ever buy a wooden head. And it was a couple years later, a woman come and says, I got a set of ho moose horns. Would you put these moose horns on a wooden head? So a woman came up with this idea and I heard this in my shop every day. Every day I hear this. They go, honey, I'll let you hang that in my house because they don't see it hairy, scary, or dirty or something that's a dead animal. They see it more as an art. And then the guys get kind of what they want because they get their horns, because that's a trophy to them. But a woman doesn't see a dead animal, they see a piece of art. So there's where I kind of see where I'm going with this is where I'd like to pursue the art where people can kind of, uh, well, they get a piece of art instead of a, just a, and nothing wrong with the mounts or uh, anything. And I'm not, criticizing them or this is just another thing that could crease in value over the years instead of where it decreases and, and falls apart and then they got to get it fixed. So. I can just start carving a simple little tree because it's, it's basically when I teach or when I have um, also take an apprentice all your fundamentals are in this how you, you know, because you got to learn how to use the saw. Pretty much if you don't know how to use the tool, it doesn't do you any good. So it's just practicing with the tool. And this simple little tree that I make um, is all your fundamentals. It's like basketball. You got to learn how to dribble, you know, shoot. The fundamentals of basketball will help you be a better basketball player. Well, this is all the fundamentals of um, what you need to, you know, how you need to use the tool and how you learn the tool because you get the instructions from <laughs> the chainsaw, you know what what you not to do. I do everything that you not to do with a chainsaw. You use the tip. You use, and, I mean, pretty much I tell you not to do. <laughs> I do. So that would be I mean, a good place to start, I guess. Well, this is just the fundamentals of chainsaw carving, and this is all the things that you need to know. You need to know how to undercut. You need to know how to roll roll your saw where you can put the pine needles and that's also your fur, your feathers, whatever else you do. And it's also getting used to the tool. So this is the fundamentals of your chainsaw carving right here. Um, where has chainsaw taken me in my life? Um, I thought I'd never leave here. I thought I'd be farming uh, all my life. And it's taken me to Alaska, taken me to Boston, I got to do Boston at the International Seafood Convention to do an ice bar. I mean, I've got to travel with this. I've been to Hawaii. Um, it basically opened up the doors to travel because pretty much I can go anywhere and just start carving um, whatever's in the area and people kind of like it. So it's been, um, it's taken me on an adventure. And I think that's, um, I mean, that's exciting. and. You know, a lot of times people get stuck, you know, sometimes in life because we, we are on an adventure. And um, this carving is just a, a tool that I get to travel. And that kind of, I mean, I'm, I never wanted to go anywhere. Now I want to go everywhere. It's kind of kind of weird how that works, so. Do you use Facebook, Twitter, or other social media? Connect with us to get immediate access to behind the scenes videos, reviews, and other postcards and pioneer news. My name is Faith Mills. I'm a graphic artist from Glenwood, Minnesota. I do pencil, 
ink wash, uh, which are both black and white. Then I do watercolor, pastels. Uh, pastels are soft pastels. It's like a chalk and acrylic. I think probably my favorite medium is soft pastels because they're forgiving. Um, if you make a mistake, you can go over it. Once you do watercolor, whatever is there is there. But pastels are very forgiving. I always work this way so my hands don't, if you're left-handed, you go this way. But I'm right-handed, so I'm going to go this way. So I'm going to make a neutral background. So what I'm going to do is just fill up the back. And this paper is sandpaper. It's an archival sandpaper. It's medium grade. It really grabs the pastels. So I use my fingers a lot. Um, by the time I get done, I am a mess. But it, it's a fun way of drawing. It's fun because you can really get your you, you're almost sculpting a little bit. Once you get the pastel in there, I do a lot with my fingers. I just love Owen's Pody face. I love it. So serious. In art school, we had different projects, and one of them, I think it was called a cell painting. But what you do is you take a piece of clear plastic and you're painting everything backwards. So whatever you paint on first is going to be on the top. What I did was I drew with a black marker, a thin marker, the highlights of what I would do usually on top. And then afterwards I painted over it. And then you put a background on it and you put that whole picture on top of that background. And it's amazing, it's just, it's totally backwards of how you would usually do a picture. The main place that I've done a lot of my artwork is in Mexico, where we have a small house. There is just a picture around every corner. This is an acrylic I did, and one of the streets I just love is this street. And it just happened to be that Chicho, this guy right here, was scooting his bike down the street there. That's kind of typical scene in Tiakapan. But I've also gone with my girlfriends to Europe um, we went to Italy uh, four years ago, and this year we went to Spain and France. I've done a lot of artwork from my travels, especially in Italy. I did a lot of, of Venice and, and Cinque Terre. And such a colorful country. I would love to go to Greece. My grandfather, when he was 11 years old, came from Greece to Ellis Island. And from Ellis Island, 
he got on a train with a with a sign on his shirt that said Omaha. He had spoke no English, and he had to get to where his brother was in Omaha. And that is why I would like to go to Greece. And also, it's a beautiful country. Cool. I would make this dark here. It would be cool to be a teacher. I mean, I've taught a few classes and blend it like that. But you can start with, I would do the skin tone first. And if you could bring something out of somebody that's there already, to make them more uh, confident or, or believe in themselves, I think it's important. Art has always been a part of my life, but I didn't realize how much fun it could be until I went back to school and learned about all the different mediums and even to this day, I am learning new things. Every day I feel like I get better. I think more practice, uh, anybody can get better. By being better, it makes it more fun. If anyone wants to really get into art, or they have the love for art, I would encourage them to just start practicing. Work in whatever you like doing, and then try different things. Because you might find something that you didn't realize you were really good at. But practice makes perfect. Visit Pioneer.org for more information on postcards and other Pioneer productions. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. <laughs>